Would Resident Evil have ever seen the light of day without this bonkers Japanese horror movie? Here's a look at the obscure Resident Evil precursor you've never even heard of. Long before the first Resident Evil game was released in 1996, Sweet Home was laying the groundwork for everything it would become. The movie and video game versions of Sweet Home were both released in 1989 on the exact same day. The two versions were developed alongside each other with some disagreement over which one started first. At any rate, the film has a decidedly more video gamey feel than the vast majority of movies at the time. The Sweet Home video game was released on the Famicom console, which is essentially the Japanese equivalent of the NES. Players take control of all five of the film's main characters at different points, each with a unique skill, as they make their way through the painter's mansion and try to escape. The gameplay consists primarily of turn-based combat, puzzle solving, and exploration. The game features a much wider range of enemy types that can be seen in the film, including everything from suits of armor to skeletons. According to Bloody Disgusting, the game was never released outside of Japan. Although the project was held back by the technical limitations of the era, it was considered quite innovative and helped push the envelope forward in the burgeoning horror game genre. We don't know what's going to happen. The Sweet Home film and video game can be counted as a direct ancestor of the entire Resident Evil franchise, which has eclipsed its originator in popularity and reached several times over. In truth, calling Sweet Home the inspiration for Resident Evil might actually be an understatement. As explained by Goomba Stomp in a retrospective on Resident Evil, the project was first born as a direct remake of the Sweet Home game. Tokuru Fujiwara created the original game on the limited tech of 1989. But after major advancements had been made on video game hardware in the early 90s, Fujiwara wanted to create a 3D remake of Sweet Home. When Shinji Mikami was assigned to lead the remake, he began drifting further and further away from the source material. He wound up pulling inspiration from the 1992 horror game Alone in the Dark, as well as the zombie films of George A. Romero, making the key enemies of the game zombies. As development continued, it stopped being considered a remake and took on the new title of Biohazard in some parts of the world, and Resident Evil in others, according to Kotaku. Even still, traces of the Sweet Home DNA can still be felt. The biggest set-piece sequences in Sweet Home rely heavily on complex special effects. These showstopper moments include a mangled torso crawling along the floor and leaving its legs behind, and a corpse in a wheelchair erupting into molten goo. There's also a man's face melting off and a gigantic ghostly lightning-spewing monster of Queen Alien proportions. The execution of these key sequences represented make-or-break moments for the film. Fortunately, the production was willing to seek out the world's best special effects talent. American special effects artist Dick Smith had built up a sterling reputation after working on world-class films like The Godfather and its sequel, Taxi Driver, The Deer Hunter, Marathon Man, and Starman. Bingo. He also most personally worked on gore showcases, The Exorcist, and Scanners. Smith was riding high after the success of an Oscar win for Armadeus when he was asked to fly to Japan to handle the special effects for Sweet Home. Smith accepted the offer and delivered some incredible results. In the 1980s, CGI was still in its infancy, but things were beginning to change by the end of the decade. James Cameron has long been at the cutting edge of VFX, and his film The Abyss, released the same year as Sweet Home, pushed the form further than ever before. It's trying to communicate. Computer-generated visuals are used extremely sparingly and only really pop up in a noticeable way in the ending sequence of Sweet Home. After being reunited with her dead child and transforming into an angelic figure, the ghost rises up into the sky, seemingly ascending to heaven. A simple 3D environment rotates around the ghost as it soars from underground past the banisters of the mansion and climbs all the way up into the sky, which then crossfades back to a live-action time-lapse shot of the sky. One subtle touch that some viewers might miss is related to the many murals within Sweet Home. As they explore a deceased painter's abandoned mansion, the documentary crew uncover a number of frescoes painted on the home's walls. These paintings are key to the goals of the documentary crew, but wind up being largely inconsequential to the plot once the supernatural occurrences begin taking place. The frescoes are a bigger part of the Sweet Home video game, as there are far more of them and they provide players with important clues. As unlikely as it sounds, the frescoes can also provide viewers of the movie with clues as well. The first fresco, uncovered by the crew in particular, is loaded with foreshadowing. The various images on the mural, including a single eye, hair, fire, a baby with a small coffin, and a metal door. Though seemingly innocuous upon first glance, each one points to a key image that will pop up later in the film. 
For example, the single eye foreshadows the backstory of the ghost who lost an eye trying to save her daughter. And the small coffin is dug up outside the mansion later on and contains the ghost's dead daughter. The plot of this Japanese ghost story bears an awful lot in common with the British one. Sweet Home and The Woman in Black are both set primarily in abandoned mansions, haunted by the ghosts of mothers whose children died in tragic accidents. Both stories also climax with the protagonist digging up the corpse of the ghost's dead child outside and returning it to its rightful place inside the mansion. The novel The Woman in Black, written by Susan Hill, was first published in 1983. In a striking coincidence, the first film adaptation of The Woman in Black was made as a TV movie and aired on British television the same year Sweet Home was released. It is possible that Kiyoshi Kurosawa pulled some inspiration from the novel when writing the Sweet Home screenplay. But the similarities may also be a simple case of parallel thinking and falling back on the touchstones of the genre. <laughs> The biggest factor behind the obscurity of Sweet Home today is a film having never received an official release outside of its home country. It enjoyed a standard theatrical release in Japan but wasn't distributed any further, just like its video game counterpart. When it came for home media products, Sweet Home was released on VHS and Laserdisc, but again only in Japan. All these years later, the film has still never made its way abroad in any official capacity. It has never been released on DVD or Blu-ray or even made available to stream on any service, though a VHS rip has appeared on YouTube. Anyone outside of Japan looking to view the film through traditional means will likely have to resort to importing an old physical copy of it. Rare VHS copies of the film typically go for between $100 and $200 on eBay. Laserdisc copies of the film are even rarer but do exist. Since these dated formats are the only ways to watch the film in the modern age, the resolution is quite poor. Fans of the movie would undoubtedly be happier if a cleaned-up, remastered edition of the film were released on Blu-ray, but the rights are owned by Toho Pictures Incorporated, who have shown no interest in a re-release. One of the most important characters in Sweet Home is Emmy, the teenage daughter of the documentary director. After the ghost begins picking off the crew one by one, the priority becomes getting Emmy out of the house alive. At a certain point, she appears to be dead, but Akiko susses out that this is a test and braves the hallucinated flames and the fury of the ghost to save her. The role of Emmy was played by Nobuko Yamada, who was better known by her stage name, Nako. At the time the film was released, Nako was at the height of her fame as lead singer of the pop rock band Rebecca. The band broke up a couple of years after the release of Sweet Home, but Nako went on to have a successful solo career. She gives a solid performance, but Sweet Home is the only film in which Nako ever appears. Sweet Home was directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa in the early stage of his career. Kurosawa would go on to find major international critical success later on in his career, but was still finding his footing in the 1980s. In the beginning of his career, Kurosawa worked his way up as a director of pink films. These were a type of popular Japanese movie that included elements of softcore pornography. These days, he works at a dramatically different level and is a returning favorite of the prestigious Cannes Film Festival after having been winning several awards over the years. His later work is a world apart from Sweet Home. He continued working frequently in the horror genre. However, his filmmaking style will become defined by subtlety, restraint, and thought-provoking themes, none of which can be found in the over-the-top bombastic Sweet Home. It should come as no surprise then that Kurosawa disowned this early effort. Though Kurosawa wrote and directed the film, ownership of Sweet Home in its final form is often attributed to producer Juzo Itami. Kurosawa and Itami clash behind the scenes, and Kurosawa was left unsatisfied by the end result. Kiyoshi Kurosawa and Juzo Itami worked together a handful of times over the years. Itami acted in Bumpkin Soup, which Kurosawa wrote and directed, and Kurosawa acted in The Funeral, which Itami wrote and directed. After trading off responsibilities on a couple of projects, they joined powers for Sweet Home. But they ended up butting heads behind the scenes and fighting for creative control. Itami started out his career as an actor in the 1960s, but pivoted to focus on writing, directing, and producing in the 80s. He found success as a director with acclaimed films like The Funeral and Tampopo and didn't look back. As Midnight Type puts it, he was one of the few filmmakers to have consistent commercial success in Japan throughout the 80s. He decided that his final acting role would be in Sweet Home, with his past collaborator Kiyoshi Kurosawa. He plays an now cliché role of the old man who works at the gas station and warns the documentary crew not to go in the haunted house. 
later on going in to save them. The butting of heads between writer-slash-director Kiyoshi Kurosawa and actor-slash-producer Juzo Itami behind the scenes led to many changes in the end product. By all accounts, Itami wrestled creative control away from Kurosawa by the time the film was locked. As covered by Bloody Disgusting, Itami disagreed with many of Kurosawa's creative decisions and took matters into his own hands. After Kurosawa had finished the film, Itami went back and heavily altered it. His changes included extensive re-editing, but he also went so far as to reshoot scenes without Kurosawa's input and others that weren't in Kurosawa's script. But Midnight Eye, Itami was one of the most bankable filmmakers of 80s Japan. The majority of his alterations fell in line with making Sweet Home a more crowd-pleasing and commercially viable movie but came at the expense of Kurosawa's more artistic sensibilities. These changes are a major part of why Kurosawa disowned the film. His original cut of the movie was never released on home video, so Itami's version is the only one available to watch today. There is really no telling how drastically different Kurosawa's version might be. There is, however, a slim chance that his director's cut could still see the light of day at some point. According to Midnight Eye, a copy of the director's cut lives with a film print in Toho Studio Vault. Will we ever see it? It's doubtful, but the next time you boot up a Resident Evil game, remember that it may have never happened without the weird, obscure wonder that is Sweet Home.